Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us again. We are joined by uh, Jeff Berkowitz in Chicago as we are going to be taking a look at some of the top issues both uh, that are pending now and, and the fall election. And Jeff, uh, as we are entering now officially the election year, um, things are starting to happen. Even Joe Biden is getting out of his basement. Right, Terry. We will be covering, we will be covering today the battleground states, the key battleground states between Biden and Trump. We'll be covering the progressive income tax because that is a really hot issue here in the state of Illinois. People will vote, be voting, do they want to raise their taxes or not on November 3rd? And we'll be covering uh, the Special Investigations Committee that's being set up to look at Mike Madigan and possibly more and possibly more. But going to the battleground states, as most people know, there are probably 10 to 12 states that people say are really key. But if you want to narrow it even more, the key seven battleground states are states that, um, and there you see, we've got them up on the, uh, up on the screen. And those are states, what, what's key about that? Those are all states that uh, Donald Trump won in 2016. And they count to 120 electoral votes. Remember, he had he won by 36 votes. Okay, 306 to I don't know to whatever it was uh, to 36 to um, something like 240 or so for uh, Hillary. So the point is, he can lose a little bit. Okay, he's got 36 votes to spare. So of that 120, he could lose two states. You know, he could lose maybe Ohio and Arizona or some other combination. But he can't lose too many. And guess what, Terry? He's right now, if you believe the polls, even after the bounce he was supposed to get, which didn't seem to materialize, the bounce after that Republican National Convention that, you know, people thought, many people thought was so great, certainly the Republicans. Even after that, if you look at the real clear politics average for these seven states, he is losing every one of them, okay? So that's one. You may not believe the polls. They were wrong before. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at Michigan. There's a state. He's down by 2.6, according to Real Clear Politics. He's losing that 47.3 to 44.7. That's 2.6 points. That is um, Michigan. That is 16 electoral votes, okay? Now, Pennsylvania, 20, 20 electoral so he's down, votes. He's down, you, you got how many How many states are we uh, looking at, right? I mean, I know these seven. are the seven. Right we now just, we're just talking seven. We're just talking right, seven. Right, but uh, before we, I don't want to just scroll through each one of these one by one, just a minute. Let's, uh, it, you say he's down by each, in each state. Is he down by the margin of right. error? Is he down significantly? One of, well, the key, little... one of the key things that just came out as we're taping this on uh, the 4th of September, was in Pennsylvania, and here's another number, I don't know if you can believe or not, we'll find out later, but that Trump is getting something like 27% of the black vote. If Trump gets even something like 15 to 16% of the black vote, uh, generally, not just in Pennsylvania, I mean, every place, that is such a key factor in the Democratic uh, vote tabulations that that would be deadly for the Democrats, not only for Joe Biden, but for their congressional candidates if, if the blacks actually well, turned out like that. Look, it's a, it, there are a lot of moving parts to TV, a lot of moving parts to an election. And so when you say if that happens, then uh, Democrats are dead, not necessarily, because if they kill him on suburban white women, which they did in 2018 and were doing until recently, that could offset that increase in the black vote. There are many things that go on. It's not just one fact. Well, and we, right? we see that uh, the president uh, in his campaign, his recent campaign, did a lot of reach out, both to black Americans and had a lot of black speakers, and right. but also to women. And it was, uh, you know, those who are the uh, political uh, nuts like you and I may remember the Republican convention of 1992 uh, when uh, Bush the first was running for re-election and it was a very kind of harsh hard uh, Pat Buchanan was uh, given a primetime speaking was one of the major mistakes 
uh, speech because he had done so well in the primaries. But uh, it just kind of really turned people off, and that was one of the things that led to the factor of uh, Bush not being reelected. So this was a very uh, Republican convention that was much softer. Jeff, again, as we tape this, let me just uh, come, we'll come back to some of our discussion on these states. But one of the big factors is the economy. And as we tape this, we just got the jobs report uh, for the month of uh, August. Everyone knows uh, they, the uh, unemployment rate, despite the COVID that you know brought it up very high, it continues now to come down, uh, signaling that we're getting a rebound in the economy. Here's just a portion of the jobs report that we got early this morning. 4% for the unemployment rate. This is a big change and look at the Delgo right now. There you go. So they also revised the unemployment rate for July to 10.2%. So anyway, I want to go through some of these numbers and look at some of the, the, uh, the, uh, our average hourly earnings and also the, um, the manufacturing payrolls. Let me go to manufacturing. Uh, Steve was asking about blue collar jobs. We were looking well, the big, the big point here is, is that it went down to 8.4%. 1.37 million jobs were added in August. That was more than expected. And the reason I say that, that news just came out this morning. So when we talk about these polls that were done earlier, uh, is it still true? It's an open question. Uh, it's the economy, stupid, as James Carville so famously said back in that election of 1992. Well, remember, those, though, the polling data I gave you and that, that was based on real clear politics, they do an average of polls uh, going back sometimes two, three, sometimes eight months, okay? So that is not just one poll. That's the average of the overall polls in that state that they deemed relevant and not going back two years. Which, and so, which goes to my point, point is, though, that uh, if people were doing it uh, weeks ago or months ago, when we were people were laid off and, and uh, now with the economy coming back, those polls may or may not be as accurate. Well, Mo, I did look, not all of those states, but some poll, some of those states, four or five, had done polling and it was in the real clear politics average since the Republican convention. All of those, Biden's still ahead. So that bounce, I, I expected to see, you expected to see. I didn't see that in those polls. Maybe you need more polls. Those were only one done in the period like August 29 to September 1. But, but that is the point. You don't usually just look at one poll. You come out, yes, it's nice, very nice, that the unemployment rate, rate went down from last month 10.2% to this month 8.4%. That's a dramatic decrease. They were only expecting it to go down to 9.8, so they beat expectations. Um, that's a 1.4 million increase in jobs. That's lower than recent months, but it's still respectable. But that ain't going to win the election, okay? That's a factor that's helpful. Well, the, the, What's going to win the election? The Republicans. What's going to win the, the election the, the is the economy really turns around, is COVID turns around, is crime is still on people's minds. Those three factors. Well, it's crime, COVID, and the economy, and I think we'll look to the yeah. future. The Republicans and the president would make the case that they had record low unemployment, that they did a great job on the economy, and just trying to say what shut it down was not bad policies, but the, uh, okay. the pandemic that came along. One of the things, the criticism of uh, Joe Biden is that he's been running his campaign from the basement. So he finally got out of the basement. He actually went, as we taped this this week, he followed the president to Kenosha, uh, he held another event where he was criticized uh, in past, uh, since the, his convention, he was criticized for having these speeches where he just walks off the stage and not taking any questions. He took some questions. Let's take a look at that and we'll discuss this. I'm sorry. Where am I? Over here? Okay. You've outlined your school, your plan to reopen schools safely, but what about what happens in the interim? Right now, millions of parents across the country are facing this very impossible task. And the point is in that little thing. So he took questions, but what you notice, he was not taking these from any journalist. Those were people who were picked by his staff. This was a produced show. They even had their questions written down on cards for them. Uh, one African-American woman got up in the end. She goes, I know I'm supposed to read from this card, but this is too important and kind of exposed that this was being produced. Uh, so the criticism is still somewhat there. This is not like the president who walks out at least once a week, if not more, 
and uh, or even almost daily walks out in front of the Washington press corps and takes questions as he's going off to a helicopter somewhere. Uh, well, yeah, Joe Biden now has to appear, you know, at the what tender age of 77. He has aged dramatically in the three years since he left as vice president. I mean, he was a youthful 70, 73, 74. He is now an aging 77, if that's his age. And he's really zombie-like. I mean, seriously, it does seem like he's on medication to like, um, you know, Valium. People used to take that to sort of relax them. He seems over relaxed. Okay, I don't know what's well, going he seems on. With low him, energy, but... as the president would say, but he did. Even in that clip that we had there, he seemed a little bit fuddled, like where where to look. Uh, right. And yeah. You never do that. I mean, it's it wasn't it's, like it's this. You know, hard. Trump is like you know, hey, you're you're fake news, and I mean, he's right, got the right. rejoinder. You know, Biden's always a little like your doddering old grandfather now, and he. Uh, I mean, back uh, 25 years ago when I was covering the uh, Senate, Joe Biden was uh, one of the great speakers. I mean, he would get up and be very energetic. And, and age takes its toll on all of, all of us. The question is, how is that going to play for the electorate? Are they going to care or not? And that's subjective, something I can't, can't say. But the criticism of Biden is still that he's not really uh, taking uh, the hard questions and that he's being coddled both by his staff and people would say by the uh, press corps that they're they're not treating him the same as they treat Trump or that they expect from Trump, uh, which which would tend to play into the president's argument that when he goes out and says, can you imagine Biden trying to negotiate a deal with China? Uh, it it might give uh, Trump's arguments a little more uh, substance well, the in the amazed, minds of the voters. So the amazing thing is, according to the polling, if that's correct, it doesn't seem to have hurt him yet. Now, maybe people will be seeing the point you and I are discussing here now. Maybe they haven't seen it because he's been hiding in the basement. And apparently they decided, as we mentioned last week, his team decided that was starting to hurt him. Even though I don't see it in the polling data, they had some polling data saying he had to come out. He had to take a stronger position against the violent protests. He did that. Uh, and will the media now start peppering him with questions? Will he show up at the debates? The, the debates have now been set. They've been moderators and set. Chris Wallace from Fox is the lead person. That was kind of surprising, uh, but they balanced it out with a young woman from MSNBC who's no conservative, you know? So maybe it's balanced, who knows? The point is, the point is, we're gonna find out just, maybe we're gonna find out if if Joe Biden is up to the task of answering challenging questions and thinking thoughtfully and sharply as a president has to do, we think. Here's another thing, uh, two things. One is uh, serendipitous, but uh, I'm a shout out to my old alumni, al alum uh, at American University. Alan Lickman's a political science professor there. He is an admitted Democrat, but he has come up over the years, going back to, I believe it was 1982, uh, when he first predicted Ronald Reagan would be reelected. He's come up with like 13 keys to the White House, as he says, and he's accurately predicted who's going to win uh, the election every time, even predicting that Donald Trump would be elected in 2016, which really flew in the face of what everyone else was predicting. Right. He had just come out and said, it will be Joe Biden who wins this election. For what that's worth. Maybe this will be yeah, the time yeah. when Lickman is wrong. The other thing right. though that I think voters need to, all of us need to watch, is this might be an election unlike others in the way the election is held. We have these states where they are flooding these ballots which are not the same as me saying, hey I'm going to be out of town, uh, I live at XYZ Smith Street, send me an absentee ballot. No, now we're flooding mailboxes with these ballots, and there have been articles being circulated about how easy that is to steal votes, to go into people's mailboxes, to, to uh, basically a fraud, to have a fraudulent election, and how much harder it is to count those. These are not votes that then on paper that are going into a voting machine where we get these votes right away. And so one of the things that might happen, Jeff, and no one's really focusing on this, we may have something that is much worse than uh, 
Bush v. Gore, where it took like three weeks after that election to kind of find out who won. The question is, when we get to January, are are we even going to know who won, depending? Hopefully that's not the case, but it's something that we have to keep in mind. It's going to be great, Terry, because that's more for you and me to talk about as these things go on for several months and speculate who really won. It's like, okay. We we say tongue-in-cheek because that's the last thing I want, and... uh, that would just okay, exacerbate an already divisions within okay, this country. Before we go to topic two, let me just note, because people are going to say, hey, there really are only seven battleground states. We hear more. Yes, there are. Key. They're key again because Trump won all of those, and according to the polling, he won all of those in 2016. According to the polling, he's losing all of them now. So let me, let me add to that discussion of those seven states five others that people also think of as battleground states and how they're distinct from the category I just mentioned. Minnesota and Nevada. Minnesota, that's Hillary Clinton won both those states before, but some people think Trump could win them now. They are battleground states, but he's losing them in the polling right now. Minnesota's 10 electoral votes, Nevada's six, okay? So if he were to lose Michigan, but he were to gain Minnesota, and people are saying Minnesota seems to be more favorable to him. He's talking about going there. He was there, so forth. So those are two There's states. There's a lot of people that say these these polls don't really don't count because, as we saw in 2016, so many people that want to support Trump aren't going to come out and admit it. And well, we just yes. saw in Minnesota, to your point, with the violence yeah. that's happened, and and people are saying this is the kind of thing, the lawlessness. The rioting, the the extreme lawlessness is something that works in Trump's favor. And we see that in Minnesota, which has been traditionally a Democratic state. We just had six Democratic mayors in, in that uh, state come out and say they're going to be supporting Trump. Uh, so does that prove anything? No, it's just when you try to sift through and look at the tea leaves and look beyond these poll numbers, it may be an indication that Trump has more support than what is showing up in these polls. Well, about the polling and why it might be off, you hear people say, look, if somebody calls you and they say they're taking a poll, there are three things you don't want to tell them. You don't want to tell them you have a gun, you don't want to tell them you have gold in the house, and you don't want to tell them you're voting for Trump. Because guess what? It used to be in 2016, maybe you would be ostracized socially if you were known as a Trump voter. Now you may lose your job. Now you may be canceled, as they say in the cancel culture. So seriously, there are people who've lost their jobs for something like, hey, I'm supporting Trump. Okay. So those are reasons to be skeptical as to whether the pollsters are getting the truthful answers when they take them, even if the pollsters aren't biased. And the other thing, so we've mentioned now nine battleground states. Let me mention three more. Georgia, Texas, Iowa. Why do we say they're battleground? Because they're very close now. And those are all three states that Trump won by significant margins in 2016. He won Georgia by five points. He won Texas by nine points. He won Iowa by nine points. Right now, he's winning Georgia by one point. He's winning uh, He's winning Texas by a little bit more than three points in the polls. And he's winning Iowa by uh, almost two points, not, this, you know, not the nine he won before. Okay, and those three states account for um, 60 electoral votes. So altogether now we've mentioned 12 battleground states. But the people have to make distinctions. Life is full of subtleties. Before and we run out of time, Jeff, why don't we move let's on? Let's go on to, to topic two. Right. Yes. We're always thinking alike, okay? Progressive income tax. That's a big deal because why? In November, on November 3rd, people here in Illinois are going to get a chance to say, Well, if you're a liberal and you're progressive, you're going to say, do you want a more fair tax? That's what they call it, the fair tax. Explain before, because one of the problems, explain what it is. I I never like to presume that people understand this thing because often we talk uh, around people by using terminology. Just explain what Illinois currently has and what is a progressive tax. Basically, what Illinois has now, certain number of exemptions so you don't, barely pay any tax. Uh, uh, it, it, okay, okay. okay the, the, the short thing, Illinois basically has a flat tax. Most people who pay tax pay 
they basically pay, I think it's 4.95%. We'll yeah, so basically, let, let me, let me. A, 5%. A flat maybe, tax 5%. means that you take one per, uh, you take a percentage, whether it's 3%, 8%, 2%. You, in Illinois, it's 4.97% on the income tax, okay? So whatever your, you, you, after you take your deductions, whatever your income is, everyone pays 4.97%. That's current. We're all the same. So if We're it's a million same. dollars you're paying, if, you, if your income was a million dollars, you're going to pay about $50,000. If, you, if your income was $20,000, you're going to pay, what, about $500. So even under the flat tax, the wealthy pay a lot more because their income is higher. What is a progressive tax, Jeff? Well, just to be sure, clean up your math. You said if you if you earn twenty thousand dollars, you pay five hundred. No, actually, if it's five well, percent, you're paying a thousand. Right? No, five percent of twenty thousand would be a thousand dollars. Okay, okay. So clean up your math. Okay, but your point is valid. Your point is high income or low income. You're paying the same percent, but you're not paying the same amount of taxes, and that's the point that's often missed. People who are making much more pay much more, but the same proportion, the same percentage. Under this new tax, the basic thing is, look, there's some subtleties. If you're earning more than $250,000, you're going to be almost in the 8% range. I'm rounding up, okay? It's 7.795 or 775. And there's slight changes as you go from zero to 250000 under this and, and some people's some people's tax and, and, and before some people's we get taxes into, will go down before, but very slightly. Okay. Before we get into why that might not be a good thing, why is the governor supporting it? Well, he wants more money because he's got structural deficits. He's got a pension problem that he can't even solve with more money. He's got lots of uh, people who are in his caucus, Democrats who want to spend a lot more money, and so. You can't, you, even he knows, you can't keep spending more and more unless you get more and more revenue coming in. And so this is estimated when it's fully in effect for a year to bring in 3.6 billion. That's the estimate that the critics say it may fall for short, the, but more importantly, more importantly, the critics say if the governor if the governor spends as much as he talks about spending, he doesn't need 3.6 billion. He needs 10 billion, and if he needs 10 billion, he's going to have to raise taxes on the middle class. Let's take a that look. I have, I have, a, I have a, a graphic here. Graphic uh, that again comes from uh, Water Points, and if you can see that, Jeff, it's potential progressive tax rates that would be needed to raise $10 billion in new Illinois taxes. And according to the statistics given to us by wire points, they would say uh, what you see here on the screen. Uh, right. And Jeff, you have uh, a near PhD in economics, so take it away. What's your interpretation? Yeah, you don't need a PhD in economics. You just need the ability to read and to do simple math here because you can see our friends, people's friends, uh, some people's enemies or critics, our friends at, at WirePoints tell us in that graph that the, and you can find this, this, these graphs and other things well, tell us what it tells at WirePoints.org, wirepoints but it's see, see that in red, it's not circled, but down at the bottom it says, near the bottom, it says total new revenue raised, $10 billion. So they're saying what I said, the governor's really go projecting forward, he doesn't really need $3.6 billion, which is what this will do. Uh, what, what it would do under the rates he's suggesting. He needs 10 billion. So they estimated a schedule of rates that would give him $10 billion. And see that red part that circled? That says if, you're, if, if your income is between 50000 and $75,000, well, he's going to raise, they're projecting, he might raise your margin, he being the governor and the Democratic legislature. They were saying, they're saying that if you're going to raise $10 billion, that you're going to have to pay uh, tax the middle class, those making between fifty dollars and $75,000, you'd have to raise their income tax at 8.5%, and those people making between seventy five and $150,000, you'd have to raise it to 9%. And an important thing that we need to say is right now, with the existence of the current tax status in Illinois, 
the Illinois legislature cannot change the percentage unless they change the Constitution. It's in the Illinois Constitution. Once you change this from a flat tax to a progressive tax, the other key element of this is the legislature will be able to vote to change the rates on those. So while we might have the president or the governor say, hey, it's only going to be a tax on those making over $250,000, the critics of this say, yeah, that might be the way it starts out, but then next year the legislature could say, you know what, we need more money, so now we're going to change that rate and we're going to bring it down, not from those making above 250000 but we're going to apply that higher tax to everyone making over 100000 or over 75000 So that's another key thing, that there is nothing to stop the legislature of voting to raise the rates on all taxpayers once you approve a constitutional change. And that's what they can't do now. Their hands are tied. And Jeff, let me, before we run out of time here, I want to bring up this graphic. And this is a a graphic that shows that this is the other critical thing that they say, hey, here are the tax rates that uh, we have in the Midwest. So when we're competing for businesses that come to Illinois, we see Illinois has the four 4.95%, we might have uh, stated that wrong, Um, just under 5% in Illinois. But you see the surrounding areas and the surrounding areas um, have generally uh, about the same tax rate uh, or less than what we currently have. So that if you raise it the way the governor wants, uh, you will have higher income earners making a lot or paying a lot more, I should say. Well, look at those states, that's Michigan, that's Indiana, that's uh, Iowa, that's Kentucky, all have flat takes, all have flat taxes. So if we become one of the progressives, that puts us at a disadvantage uh, relative to those states. That is, because we're, and go back to that other chart for a second that we just had up before, because that's really key. Because folks, this is what they're arguing. Are you wealthy if you're making $50,000? Because they're going to be raising. That's what they're arguing. Your rate's going to go up to 8.5%. Okay, from right now, probably roughly 5%. That's a big boost. Okay, ready? Okay. So this is really a key graphic because what it shows, folks, is that if the folks at wire points are right, and if the governors and the Democrats, who are basically supporting a higher tax, Republicans are opposing it, If that's true, they're going to be raising the taxes, your taxes, if you've got an income of $50,000 to to 8.5%. That's a big boost. And if it's over $75,000, if your income is over $75,000 to $150,000, that's $9,000. And if you're like a millionaire, well, now you're boosting not to 8%, but to 11%. The short thing is everybody's taxes are going up, and they're going up big time. And remember... 170,000 people have left Illinois since 2010 with our flat tax because we have the highest property taxes, according to the Kiplinger survey, highest property taxes in the country, um, highest overall combined sales tax in the country. Now we're going to have this great income tax increase. They're going to be going in droves as, and businesses also are going to have their taxes raised. So as business leaves, as high income people leave, as middle income people leave, guess what? You're going to get not more revenue, you're going to get less revenue. That is the scenario the anti-progressive income tax people pay. We've mentioned what the scenario is for the other. The main thing is, this is the big battleground. Talk about battleground states. Illinois is a battleground state on the issue of should we or should we not have this proposed income tax rate. Come back next week, folks, because next week we might get into the Special Investigations Committee. That's the one that says maybe Investigating maybe what? the end is near for Mike Maddox. Investigating maybe Mike the Maddox. End is near. So big issues on the horizon. Jeff and I will take a look. Thank you for joining us.